Welcome to the Explore the Bible Sunday School Lesson for June 11, 2023. Today we're in the second chapter of the book of Jeremiah. And as you're turning to that passage, let me make a couple of comments about uh, things that are going on as opposed to just getting right into the lesson. First, let me comment on last week's lesson. I made mention in there, if I remember correctly, that there were 350 references in the Bible that are translated, this is the Lord's declaration or as it would be said in the King James, thus saith the Lord. I misspoke when I said there's 350 times in the Bible because it's 350 times in just the Old Testament alone. 350 times in the Old Testament, the Bible says, thus saith the Lord. Well, the important part of that is, is that 157 of those 350 times are found in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 157 times says, this is the Lord's declaration. Thus saith the Lord, depending on how the translations, the versions translate it. It is truly a w way of seeing that Jeremiah is God's message to the people. Not the message of a man, but the message of God. The other thing I wanted to mention before we actually get into our lesson today is the fact that this is the week of Vacation Bible School at our church. Our congregation is reaching out. There'll be 300 kids and leaders in the building this week as we uh, seek to tell the boys and girls the true gospel message, to tell them about how they can know Jesus Christ as their Savior, and help them to understand more what the Bible says but the Bible teaches about how we're to live our lives. I, we request that you pray for the work of this week. Even if the week is over, God will still be dealing in the hearts and minds of these young boys and girls. Many of them will come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, which is an exciting thing. Some of them may feel the call to a ministry position, to be pastors, uh, missionaries, uh, to work in a church, to be a leader in a church. And this week will be the foundational week for making that decision. So pray for us. Be excited about us. Understand that I'm actually in my own home tonight uh, as I am preparing this message because I was looking for a quiet place. Vacation Bible School week, there's not very many quiet places around our church building. So looking today at our lesson, to, this is the second session in the book of Jeremiah of our summer quarter. And in this section, chapter 2 through uh, verses 1 through 13, we'll be looking at how God prepares, how God does the work that needs to be done. The truth of what we're going to look at here is that this is a beginning of um, a series of messages that Jeremiah preached to the people on repentance. From chapter 2, verse 1, through chapter 25, verse 38, there are a series of messages calling the people to repentance uh, for what they have done in leaving the Lord. Five things are going to be shown by Jeremiah as he goes through these different sermons and we'll find emphasized in different sermons, uh, different parts of this. But the first thing he's going to emphasize is how the people were blessed when they followed Jesus, how they are blessed when they did what God called them to do, when they obeyed his rules, when they worshiped him and him alone. But he's also going to show them, secondly, that this judgment that is coming upon them isn't because God is wishy-washy or, or unconcerned, but is a cause and effect that comes about because of their sinfulness, because of their leaving the Lord, that it becomes the outcome of their choice that they are judged. He's also going to show them how this judgment is going to come. It's going to be poured out upon them from the nations of the north. It's not going to be fire and brimstone like uh, rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not going to be a terrible earthquake that will d destroy their land or a plague that will come through their land. It's not going to be uh, any of these natural disasters, but it's going to be an invading army. It's a reminder to us that that God can use the pagan nations of this world to judge his people, to discipline his people. God is going to do that and allow them to come. The fourth thing that he's going to call upon them is that they need to prepare. 
This judgment coming is an assurity. It is definitely going to happen. And so he has said to them, you once followed God. You brought this upon yourself. It's going to be the different nations that are from the north that have come and minister this punishment. You need to prepare and get ready. But then he's also going to have a fifth thing to say, and that is that God is a God of forgiveness, that they need to repent and turn to God, and God would meet them. God would be gracious to them, and God would understand. And as I look at this, I really come to understand that this is a message that our nation needs. If there's truly a nation that has moved away from God, it's our nation. When we were founded back in the 1770s, there was a time of, of, of great following of the Lord, a time when his word was important, where people believed in him. And even if they didn't serve him like they uh, should, they knew he was God, and they acknowledged that. We, through the years, have grown away from him. We're not allowing God to be a part of our nation's life like we did at the beginning. We are experiencing today what it's like when the hand of God is taken off of a nation. I remember as a young minister 50 years ago how that I would go to conferences and I'd hear people saying things like, America is not, not the Christian nation it was. Or saying, America is a Christian nation becoming a post-Christian nation, leaving Christianity behind. Today, I think we could look at our nation and say, we are not a Christian nation. We're not even a post-Christian nation. What we are is a post-Christian nation becoming a pagan nation. Today it's acceptable to worship every God there is except the Lord God, Jesus Christ. You can't have your Bible with you. You can't uh, pray in public. You can't do these things that will honor in the true God. You can worship any other God you want to, any other false religion. Uh, you can worship uh, the government, medicine, uh, your bank account, uh, pleasure. You're, you could be your own God. You make up the rules and you follow them. Well, just like Judah was judged for what they did, I believe we can look around at our nation and see how God has taken his hand off our nation. And we need to come back to him. As Jeremiah calls his people for repentance, our nation needs to come to repentance. Let's pray together. Father, how grateful I am that you are a God who forgives. And I pray that you would help us to understand the need that we have as a nation and as individuals to come back to you and to follow you, that you would be the Lord of our lives, that you would be the one who guides our lives, that you would be the one we worship. Father, as we look at this message today, help us to understand the truths that are there. And in understanding those truths, then we would be faithful to follow you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. In this first lesson, uh, or this first sermon here, the second lesson of this series, we're going to look at what we would call apostasy. Apostasy is a word that we use in church life. It is taken from the Greek word apostasia, and basically it means to fall away. In fact, the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines this as an act of refusing to continue to follow, obey, or recognize a religious faith. It is the falling away. One has described it as the bride falling out of love with her groom. Once there was a time when she was devoted to him. She loved him in a sense that it was just overwhelming. She would do everything that she could for him. His desires were her desires. But there comes a time when she falls away from that deep feeling of love and begins to turn away from him, perhaps to another. And this is a very appropriate way of understanding apostasy because you see, we are the bride of Christ. Those who are the believers in Jesus Christ are described as his bride. He is the groom. He is the husband. We are the bride. And as the bride physically in an earthly relationship might turn away. The bride here in the spiritual relationship has turned away. Uh, we need to understand, though, that just like in the 
physical relationship here on earth, this would not be a quick event. It would not be a sudden turning, but it would be something that took place over time. Uh, this has been called a spiritual drift, and that's really what is happening here in uh, the nation of Judah. They have spiritually drifted away from God, turning away from the Lord, turning away from His past, turning away from His principles and His ways. And Jeremiah comes to them, and he calls for them to, to remember, uh, remember what it was like. He says in the first three verses of the second chapter, The word of the Lord came to me, Go and announce directly to Jerusalem that this is what the Lord says. I remember the loyalty of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness, in a land not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who ate of it found themselves guilty. Disaster came on them. This is the Lord's declaration. In this passage here, he's, he's, he's very deliberate. Jeremiah is very deliberate as he identifies the source of the message. This is from the Lord. This is the Lord's message, he says. This isn't my message. You know, it's easy to attack the messenger than it is to attack the message. And here, Jeremiah wants them to know he's only the messenger. This is God's message for them, God's message to them. Uh, you know, we see this today. If people stand up for what God says, if people teach what God says, then they are attacked. Their character is what is uh, beaten down. Not the message, because the people of the world know, Satan's people know, they cannot attack the message of God. So they attack the messenger. Jeremiah, from the very beginning, makes it clear. I'm just an honest reporter trying to tell you what God says. Jeremiah calls for them to remember. Remember the loyalty of your youth. Now, I know we could look at this and say, well, there, he's talking about this generation. He said, you're, you're an older group right now, but I want you to look back when you were children and how you followed the Lord. I don't think that's what he's saying. I think he's talking about the youth of the nation. I think he's saying back, don't, don't look back at your generation. Look back generations. Look back to the beginning of the nation. And I think as we look later, and we see in, uh, in our next section of study here, as the editors have divided this passage in chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, we're going to see that he is talking about that at the beginning. But the implication he wants them to understand is, you've fallen away. You've left what you once were. You need to stop and remember what it was like before. Perhaps much like it was uh, when John wrote to the church at Ephesus, the message that God had for the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2, where he told them to, to look and see how they had left their first love. They needed to come back because they had left their first love. They needed to repent and do the things they had done before. That's what is going on here. Jeremiah is saying, you have left your first love. You have left your loyalty to God. And when he says loyalty here, when the Christian Standard Bible translates this loyalty, it could just as easily as translated this as love or devotion or faithfulness. You've left your faithfulness to God. You're no longer the faithful one you once were. And remember that that faithfulness to God, that loyalty to God was motivated by love because you loved him so much by your desire to serve him. It wasn't because you were afraid. It wasn't because you were coerced, but you did this out of a love for the Lord God. He says, look and see what you have done. You followed the Lord for 40 years in the wilderness. For 40 years, you let him lead you. Yes, they had their times of rebellion. Yes, they had their times when they turned away from Moses. But they came back and followed God through that time. For the most part, they trusted him. They obeyed him. Look at where they were. Look at the land that they had here. Um, as they trusted. Well, first of all, let's look at how they trusted God. 
He says here, you were set apart for me. You were chosen for me. Out of all the nations in the world, I set you apart. You were the first fruits for me. Now, he had had, God had called individuals through the years. He, you know, he called Noah. Uh, he called Abraham. He called Joseph there in Egypt. He called out Moses. But as a nation, this was the first nation formed already that God called. Promised to Abraham, but called as a nation to come out of Egypt, to be the first fruits, to be the first of those who uh, were his. But not the only fruit. They were to be an example for the rest of the world. That looking at them, they would see God shining through them. And the nations of the world would come to God because of that. He would provide for them. And because of that, they would love him and they would serve him. And the nations of the world would want to do the same to them. But woe to their enemies. Woe to those who, uh, Jeremiah says, ate of the first fruits. That would be the, those who came in and nibbled away at parts of Israel, of Judah, who tried to take this territory, to try to take this city, who would be attacking Jeremiah says, remember how the Lord defended you? Remember how the Lord provided for you? He was your defense. He was the one who watched over you. Do you remember these things? Have you, have you forgotten these things? Look at verses 4 through 8. He says, <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord, house of Jacob, and all families of the house of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they would went so far from me to follow worthless idols and became worthless themselves? They stopped asking, Where is the Lord who brought us from the land of Egypt, who led us through the wilderness and through a land of deserts and ravines, through a land of drought and darkness, a land no one travels through and where no one lived? I brought you to a fertile land to eat its fruit and bounty, but you entered and defiled my land. You made my inheritance detestable. The priest quit asking, Where is the Lord? The experts in the law no longer knew me. The rulers rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, and they followed useless idols. He says here, Look at the past. Have you forgotten about the patriarchs of old? And he uses the patriarch here, Jacob, later known as Israel. He was the father of the 12 tribes. He would be something that would remind them of their spiritual heritage, of who they had been in the past, who they were. And he says, you were my descendants. You were the descendants. Physically, the descendants of Jacob. Spiritually, the descendants of me. Don't you remember this? Have you forgotten? Where, where did it go wrong, God says? What happened to cause you to turn away from me? God asks, what did I do wrong? In fact, he says, what fault did your ancestors find in me? What did I do that caused you to leave worshiping me to worship a false idol, a worthless idol? You know, this is a not so subtle reminder that God didn't do anything to drive them away. That was simply their choice. They did it on their own. God drives home his point. He says, look at my loving deeds for you. Look at what I did for you. I brought you out of Egypt. There you were in slavery, uh, forced to work for the Egyptians, no free will of your own, and I brought you out of that. Not only did I bring you out of Egypt, I guided you through the wilderness. I saw you through that barren land, that barren wilderness. Look how God describes that land. He uses the words desert and ravines, drought and darkness. You can imagine uh, what the terrain was like with desert land and ravines that they had to go through with the darkness and the and the drought, the dry weather, the, the darkness at night would be the dark of dark. 
He says it was a land with no travelers, with no residents. There wasn't anybody else around. It was uninhabited. It was uninhabitable. This is the land that God says, I brought you through. I'm the one who did it, God says. And I brought you through it so that I could take you to a land that was better by far. Look at the contrast that he has here. Not deserts and ravines, drought and darkness, but a land that was fertile with fruit, fertile with bounty. Truly a land that was flowing with milk and honey. God said, this is what I gave to you. This is what I did for you. I have poured my blessings out upon you. And you turned your back on me. You turned away from me. Look how bad it is here. Jeremiah says, look, even the priests are turning their back on me. They no longer ask where God is. One of the functions of the priest was to mediate between the people and God. And they would come to him with their with to them with their sacrifices and and the priest would offer up the sacrifice to God. Now, they don't bother with it. They're not even concerned about where God is. How would they go to God and ask for forgiveness for this family or this or for the nation? They're not even concerned about where God is at that moment in time. They didn't care to even know where he was. He talks about the experts of the law. They were supposed to be the ones who kept the law, the best of all, who knew the law, and they didn't. They no longer knew what the, Lord, what the law said. It was no longer that important to them. It was something that they would just interpret for themselves as they thought it ought to be interpreted. And they weren't interested in what God said. He talks about how the rulers had rebelled, leading the people away from God, leading them into a place where they were far from God. Often the Bible describes the leaders of the nation as having done evil in the sight of the Lord. So what is this? The priests, the experts in the law, the, the uh, rulers, that would be the, the religious, uh, the legal, the administrative leaders. All three groups of them had turned away from God, rebelled against from them. They had turned away from Yahweh, the one true God, to worship even the Baals, the false gods, turning to Baal instead of turning to God. They had exchanged the things of God. In verse 9, it tells us, Therefore I will bring a case against you again. This is the Lord's declaration. I will bring a case against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Cyprus and take a look. Send someone to Kedar and consider carefully. See if there's ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever exchanged its gods? But they're not gods. Yet my people have exchanged their glory for useless idols. Be appalled at this, heavens. Be shocked and utterly desolated. This is the Lord's declaration. For my people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water, and dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. This has gone on for generations and generations. And the effects of what has happened will continue for generations and generations. It won't be just the generation that Jeremiah is a part of, but it will be their children and their children's children. So even to the grandchildren, the effect of this will be seen. Jeremiah says, do something for me. Go to the coast of Cyprus. Now Cyprus was an island nation uh, in the Mediterranean there off the western uh, shore. He says, look around there. Go to Kedar. Now we're not sure exactly where Kedar is. Many believe that it was a city in the desert region to the south of Jerusalem. Uh, in the Arabian Peninsula there. And I think that kind of fits it in because it's like he's saying, on the water and on the land, uh, where there's plenty of water, where it's desert. You look in both of these places and you will never be able to discover 
where a nation has exchanged its gods. It's where they have thrown one god out and taken another. And that other god that they have taken isn't even a god. It's a worthless idol. You have exchanged the glory and here he uses a capital G. So he's talking about the Lord and what the Lord could do and the glory that comes from being a part of the Lord's. You've exchanged that glory for a worthless idol. You have nothing. It is so bad that even the heavens are appalled at what happened. Even the, the universe itself is appalled. It, they're shocked, desolated at what you have happened. Look what you have gotten. You exchanged God and you got a cracked cistern, a broken cistern. This is a, a valuable word picture. As I show you here this picture, uh, this is of a cistern that was dug out in the Qumran community. It would be large enough for a small village to use. The cisterns were a water collection system. It was a place for the water to uh, run into it as it, the rain came and it would be brought down different uh, troughs, channels that would drop it into here. Uh, the rain, the uh, moisture would fill this up. Uh, some of you may like to watch the uh, program Building Off the Grid and you'll know that often if they're not able to have a well, they would have a a cistern, a water collection system, a large tank that they would take the rainwater off the roof or the water from around the land and keep it. That's what this is here, what the people are looking at in this photograph. Imagine what would happen if there was an earthquake or if the ground, the soil under the bottom of the cistern, the foundation of the cistern uh, shifted away and the cistern cracked, it would no longer be useful. Now, that which is carved out would no longer be effective in keeping water and holding water. And that's what God says you have, have gotten. You have exchanged the fountain of water, that fountain that was always flowing with water. Uh, we would know as the living water, but that water that was constantly there for you, constantly provided for you and you've exchanged it for a cistern that won't even hold water, that lets all the water that collects in it leak away. This was the word picture that Jeremiah left the people with. And stop and think about that. That's not something we want in our lives today. It's not something we want in our nation today. We want God and his blessings for us especially in our own lives. So let me ask you today, how can we go about avoiding that apostasy, that spiritual drift in our lives? What is it that we can do? What would you think you could do? If, if you were to write down two or three things that you could do, what would you say? Well, I think that uh, three things that come to my mind right away is that we need to have intentionality. We have to intentionally decide that we're not going to drift, that we're going to stay close to God and we're going to follow God and make that definite decision. We're not going there. We're going to stay with God. There's intentionality, but I think there's also the making of the time. We need to set aside time to, to be in God's word, to be in prayer, uh, to be a part of, of studying God's Word so that we will know how to be what we ought to be. There's that intentionality. There's that uh, making of the time. But then there's also the need for consistency. To avoid the spiritual drift, we need to be consistent in our worship, consistent in our ministry, consistent in our Bible study, consistent in our prayer life, it's not making time once a week to go to church on Sunday. It's making time consistently day after day after day to stay close with God every day. This is what God is calling for us. And this is what we need to carry from this lesson today. We need that consistency, that making of time, that intentionality. 
we need to be on guard against the spiritual drift. And where there is that spiritual drift, we need to repent and return to God. He understands that we're going to falter, that we're not going to be perfect. The only perfect one was hung on the cross. And he knows we're going to make mistakes, but he is forgiving and loving. A father that cares for his children, we need to come back to him. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you're a God who forgives. And I pray that you would help us to see the errors of our way. And with consistency, uh, come back to you. Making the time to be with you. Intentionally following you. That we might be what you would have us to be. Watch over our nation, Father. Give us strong men and women who will proclaim clearly in their Sunday school classes, in their family rooms, in their businesses, in their homes, wherever they are, that you are Lord and you alone, and we will follow you. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Our next lesson is going to be uh, taken from the seventh chapter of Jeremiah as we look at how personal all of this is. I look forward to being with you when we study God's Word again.